Okay, let's look at verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. So, see, because God saw their works, these tribulation saints, that they're really working really well. So because of that, he gave them an open door to enter inside David's house, to be part of the ruling of the nation of Israel. When God sets before them an open door, notice right here, no man can shut it. No one can shut it. No one has the power to shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and notice this little strength is enough, and kept and has kept my word and has not denied my name. Look at that. If you don't deny Jesus' name, you keep his word, you may, be, you may feel down about the little strength, but you'd be surprised how much that little strength can carry you. You ever felt like that throughout your day? You're like, God, I need more grace. I need more strength. Help me out with this problem. And you feel like you're so weak. But Paul mentioned, for when I am weak, then I am strong. See, that little strength can carry you so far. So a spiritual application right here is like a Christian he has just enough strength that he needs right here that can carry him through. And guess what? When God opens a door for you, guess what? The devil can't close it. We're going to shut down San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Well, try me, man. You can't do it if God opens the door. God can, and guess what? I can't even close it myself. If God set an open door right here, there's nothing I can do that will stop this. But if God closes it, neither can anyone do anything about it either. So what's so important to understand is to not be in fearful mode every day of your life when God closes a door on you and you believe that it is your mistake, your fault. You've got to understand that, look, it can't be helped. If God closed it, there's nothing you can do about it. But guess what? When God closes one door, he opens another. And when he opens that other door, no man can shut it. But it's so sad how many Christians, they keep looking at closed doors rather than open doors. Now, in the day of Philadelphia, this can definitely apply. So here's the timeline now for Philadelphia for the church age. Because I'm covering church age application right here, right? In the church age application, I'm going to give you two timelines right here. It can be 1700 to 1900. That's Larkin's timetable. Dr. Uckman puts this at 1500 to 1900. All right, now I'm going to give an explanation to why for both sides. So Larkin, he puts it at 1700 to 1900. The reason why is because that's when the first Great Awakening revival happened. Not only that, that's when the earliest type of Christian missionaries after the Roman Catholic Church era was available that time. It was the Moravian missionaries during the 1700s that time. So it was a perfect time for revival. Remember, Philadelphia had open doors and no man can shut it. So they were finding open doors everywhere spreading the gospel, and no one could shut it. So that's why Larkin puts it at 1700 to 1900. 1900 is accurate because that's when everything went downhill, and we can all agree with that with an amen right there. I mean, look at the, look at the 20th century, you know. It's just the dead, 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 dead. We have to use entertainment to build a ministry rather than God the Holy Spirit opening the door and flooding it in right there. This was a time of Great Awakening Revival. Dr. Uppman, he puts that 1500 to 1900 because during that time, that's when officially the mainstream type of Protestant Christianity uh, and then Baptists who eventually came out, that was when it officially started with Martin Luther's time period. So it was during that time when it finally broke off from the Roman Catholic Church system that some kind of evangelical or Christian traditional form finally came out that time. And to be quite honest, even though as Sardis, I explained why it was considered a dead timeline, right? 1500 to 1700 to Larkin. Because Luther and all the other guys, a lot of them were infested with Calvinism. And because of that, they just did nothing but sit at home, see? So it was pretty dead that time, which is why this date is understandable. But this date is also understandable from Ruckman's viewpoint because, let's be honest, despite of them being dead in their evangelism, it was growing. It was growing. And not only that, that's when the King James Bible eventually came out. And when that King James Bible came out, that went boom, boom, boom with John Bunyan and a lot of other people starting it. So that's the reason why these two dates could probably work right here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the Philadelphia timeline, which is the golden age. <clears throat> And 
you know, I never mentioned this, but I'm going to mention it now. So I'm going to teach history of Bible believers either this coming Sunday or the next Sunday. That one, you'll better understand about the Philadelphia timeline, why that's the real thing. All right, my, I, I hope that the church likes it. You guys enjoy that, right, when I do that? Okay, then. It's not repetitive, right? Okay, so I do this once a year. I do this once a year. That way we can uh, rouse up our spirits. That's probably my crowning achievement is history of Bible believers, that one. So anyways, aside from that, um, the Philadelphia timeline, if I shoot off my mouth about the Great Awakening revivals, uh, history of Bible believers would do a better job covering it. But I can cover a few things right here, a few things just on liquor merchants, just on liquor merchants. So one time, there was, uh, I think the preacher's name was J. Harold Smith, I think. But this preacher right here, he was preaching hard against liquor that time. And then one of these people uh, took out a gun and he was going to drive by and shoot the preacher. And then his buddy was saying, shoot the preacher, shoot the preacher. But when he tried to shoot him, he couldn't shoot the preacher. And then he, he just froze and then the car kept driving by. And the guy, what he did was, is that he jumped out of the car, threw out his gun after that. And then he walked back to the camp meeting and the guy who was going to shoot down the preacher actually walked back to the camp meeting, gave a testimony that I was about to kill this preacher, but I repented, got right, and got saved. Hey, hey. Now let me give you another liquor uh, merchant story with a gun. All right? One time there was this uh, person who was behind George uh, Whitfield's back with a gun, and he said, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to shoot you. And then Whitfield, uh, Whitfield challenged him, like if he's man enough to shoot, but, and then Whitfield... Because his voice boomed a mile long, he just preached really hard, boomed a mile long. This guy threatened him with the gun. He said, I'm going to shoot it. I'm going to do it. But then before he can do it, the, blunt, the, the gun blew up on his hands. And then the guy injured himself after that. Now, let me tell you another gun story right here. This is only gun stories. You, that's what I'm telling you. Read, read uh, these Great Awakening Revival stuff, man. You're missing out. Mordecai Ham. He was infamous for uh, closing down the bars. And then a lot of liquor merchants hated him. They threatened his life. They threatened to kidnap his boy. And I think one time they even uh, tied him at the end of a vehicle. And then he uh, was dragged along a little bit on the road. But Mordecai Ham, he preached hard. And then one time this person had an alcohol bottle. And then he pointed a gun at Mordecai Ham. He said, I'm going to shoot you. And you know what Mordecai Ham did? Well, J. Harold Smith, you know, he was preaching while the guy passed by him. George Whitfield, he just let the guy point the gun on his back. Mordecai Ham just ran toward that guy who was pointing the gun at him. He jumped off the state, jumped off the podium, marched toward that guy with the gun pointing at him, and he was singing, Tell Mother I'll Be There. That's the hymn that he was singing. Tell Mother I'll Be There. I'm going home to heaven. And the guy was going back and getting more scary. He said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then finally, the fear of God fell upon him that he just dropped. He said, I repent. And then he threw away his gun, his deck of cards, went on the altar, got right with God, and got saved. Now, these are all just gun stories. <laughs> Listen to the Great Awakening revival stories, man. It's just awesome. It's just, this was the golden day and age. You had the first Great Awakening revival by Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, John Wesley, David Brainerd, those guys were the, uh, the kings during that time. And then you also had Finney and Peter Cartwright and Billy Gray, uh, Billy Gray, Billy Bray that time. Billy Bray is a really awesome guy. He's one of my favorite characters, actually, but uh, I'm not going to say his stories right now. And then there was the Second Great Awakening Revival. During that time, that was a timeline of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was the king of revival preaching right here. That guy, one time he was preaching, and then all these stupid, I guess, liberal news reporters, they just want to catch him on something. Some of these scholars want to catch him. And they went to Moody and he said, Mr. Moody, I counted uh, about a hundred something grammatical errors in your preaching. And you know what Moody did? He, stick out, he stuck out his tongue at that reporter and he said, see that? I'm using that for the glory of God. What are you using yours for? Man, that, that was that, that time. Maybe one day if CNN does that, I'm going to do that right at them, mm, like that. I'm going to go like that, uh, and I'm going to say, see that? I'm using that for the glory of God. What are you using yours for, huh? Amen. You wicked little punk, you. Amen. Amen. All right, that's the only bad thing I'll say about them. But anyway, 
So the thing is, is that during that time, they were bold, man. That was when God, the Holy Spirit, was powerfully moving within them. You guys don't know real Christianity, man. You guys lose, lost that fire at Laodicea, which we're in today. You guys got to read these stories. You guys got to read these stories. Billy Sunday was the last revival during that time. During that time, he was known as the Sawdust Trail Preacher. He would literally slide across the bases when he preaches, actually. He'll run around the room. He'll break chairs, man. You think that the blowout that, man, these preachers are intense. Man, some of these people are running around the room when they're him singing. If you're at Billy Bray's day, I mean, Billy Sunday's day, you would walk out of the church service all mad. Well, I saw Joel Osteen, and he was more prestigious and well-contained, you know. What, who is this preacher? His name's Billy Sunday, man. You missed out. You don't know what real revival is during that time. During that time. Billy Sunday, when he got saved, you know what he was doing? There was a bunch of people street preaching, singing hymns outside. And then Billy Sunday was walking over to that group while his friends were laughing at him. And Billy Sunday went over to them, drinking baseball star, forsook that because of him singing at street preaching, got saved at that mission. By the way, that mission was founded by another person who was a drunk. I think his name was Mel Trotter. But it was under this person's mission where Mel Trotter, he would constantly drink himself to death. And one time he was going to lose his family and children and everything. And then what happened was Mel Trotter walked by this rescue mission. And a guy was out in the coal passing out tracts, trying to invite people to church. This guy invited Mel Trotter and Mel Trotter got saved. And guess what? Mel Trotter started his own rescue mission, and that's where the baseball star Billy Sunday got over there and got saved. You want me to tell you more? Man, this is something right here. This is something.